It is my pleasure to present our speaker today, Josh Mutis. Mutis, thank you. Uh, from Google Santa Barbara. I've known Josh for quite some time now. He was a postdoc in the group of John Martinez in Santa Barbara, who is one of the key players in the game of quantum computing right now. He's one of the leading people actually building experiments with superconducting quantum computing circuits. So Josh joined uh, Dr. Martinez's group as a postdoc. He was there when uh, Google came and hired the entire group. And so all their postdocs, all their research associates went to Google. And Google even built a new office in Santa Barbara right across the street from UCSB. You rent, you rent an office. <laughs> uh, that's now the official Google office in Google Santa Barbara where they're building quantum hardware. And so Josh is going to tell us today about what they're doing at Google why they're doing it with Google, and what you can expect in the near future. Thank you, Jeff. Thanks a lot, Justin. Thanks for the invitation, and we had a great time touring Chapman. It's really beautiful. It's really nice. Uh, so, yeah, as Justin mentioned, I'm from a quantum hardware group at Google, and that could mean a lot of different things to a lot of people, uh, or mean nothing to a lot of people. It's kind of weird and steamed and mystery. So I wanted to take this opportunity to give a very um, a broad overview talk of what we do at the Quantum Harbor. What we're, why Google is interested in having a Quantum Harbor in the first place, because it's not immediately obvious. And the, the, the paths that we're taking in our research to actually build a quantum computer. So in our uh, group, we're only about 20 of us, but we have two main threads here for building a quantum computer. And what you see here on the screen are two different chips. And I'll just take a step back just to explain a little bit of what I'm showing. We get a lot of kind of pretty pictures of these things. But what these are are uh, integrated circuits, a lot like what you'd have on your phone or your computer, but way, 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 way simple. So what I like about these devices is that they're big enough that you can see the working parts with your eye. Like it's a pretty good uh, lens on a camera. And there's two flavors of chip that Something we use uh, called a quantum annealer, and if you're familiar with the company D-Wave, that's the approach of quantum computing that they're taking. And another thread, um, we're doing something called bulk polymer quantum computing. And the analogy I want to take to conventional computing is that there's two ways you can make a computer out of transistors or uh, op amps or what have you. You can make what's called an analog simulator, where you take analog components, you break down your uh, the equation of the physical problem you're searching. And you make uh, an electronic circuit to mimic that, you get an answer. Or you make a digital computer that you can program generally, and you can put any solution out of problem you want. And we're taking those two uh, computing models, and we're trying to do those in quantum mechanics. We're using the, this uh, quantum annealer, or this basically an analog quantum simulator, to approach what's called machine learning algorithm. But at the same time, we're trying to build a fully error-corrected digital quantum computer. So the analog to the kind of computer that has taken over the world, where you can simulate something arbitrary, you can program it with anything, like kind of like a quantum version of a Turing complete computer. Google's main, um, it's, oh, there we go. Google's main interest in uh, quantum computers is to solve what are called uh, machine learning. Framework called machine learning models. And machine learning is a very broad and hot field where you uh, basically want to solve a problem that's hard to, to program in a, in a traditional sense. So you come up with a model and you train a computer to do it so it'll do it all the time. And Google has a bunch of products, more and more that they're offering every day, um, that do this sort of thing. And a, an example of that is Google's photo app. So I have well, up here is my Google's photo uh, thing. I'll just show for the company just a little bit to show what you can do. But I can take, you see here, I like tons of different photos, my kids, some things from work, swimming, whatever. If I want to know, if, if there's a picture I'm looking for that happened a couple years ago where we had a, a forklift, I can search for the word forklift. And through the magic of machine learning, it can look through all of my photos and find all of the pictures of the forklift. Hmm. Similarly, I can, we took a trip to Disneyland a little while back, just up the road. I can look for Disneyland and see all the pictures of Disneyland. This kind of thing is a little bit magical and it's, uh, it's the kind of service that's really expensive and hard to do on conventional computers, but provide a lot of utility for all of our users. And it's kind of our competitive advantage, why we want to keep people Google rather than going to Facebook or to Amazon. 
behind the scenes to make uh, the algorithm. So what a machine learning uh, algorithm does at the, uh, at the very base is it takes a set of inputs and maps it to a set of outputs or a set of labels. And what it does is it takes all the pixels in this image, in this picture of my dog, and it puts it in these networks. And then it knows that pictures can have to be associated with labels. And you find all the correlations between these pixels that happen to be highly likely to be, uh, highly likely to be correlated with the label. So you run a whole bunch of data through it, a whole bunch of different pictures of uh, dogs. We call it a training set. You end up weighting all of these network, these connections between these networks, which are just basically these correlations between pixels, and getting a really good association with the label. And you do this with a whole bunch of different kinds of people's faces, with all sorts of different labels, like you can look for your receipts, you can look for Disneyland, like I showed. But this is a very like highly connected system. It's very complicated. Running this uh, on a computer is really expensive, and moreover, you have to, this isn't a perfectly general thing. Nobody actually knows what the right network looks like for doing these machine learning problems. So you have to try it on different networks to find out which networks are suited to which problems uh, in order to, to experiment and to make progress. Turns out that you could map this problem and this whole set of optimization problems pretty well onto the kind of bread and butter physics problem that a lot of people in this room are probably familiar with. This um, these, uh, these lattice optimization problems, these kind of like Hubbard models, <coughs> where you have a bunch of nodes interconnected in a bunch of ways with a bunch of different weights. And the hope is that because uh, lattices of atoms or quantum materials are doing this every day for free, we can somehow embed the problems that we're interested in into these more general, or these specific physical problems. So our goal is to make an analog in hardware with these coupled spins, where you can make a whole bunch of spins coupled with each other with a whole bunch of programmable weights between, or programmable coupling between them in different ways, and hope that we can embed these more general machine learning problems onto them and solve them quickly in this native way. Uh, and to kind of explain how this works in a, in a cartoon fashion, you can think, of this, this uh, network of spins corresponds to some kind of energy landscape. Each spin has a set of neighboring spins and has some sort of order uh, or ordering which has an energy associated to it. And solve, training your algorithm or solving this problem is basically finding the minimum of that. So you could conceive of the very simple schematic diagram here where you can trivially find the local minimum, but you can also make more arbitrary, what we want to do is make more arbitrary physical systems where we can program uh, more rich landscapes. And so the idea is basically you program some, some landscape and you, uh, in your problem space, and you want to find basically what are the, the lowest minima you can find. So you can do this um, classically in using something called simulated annealing. It's basically where you uh, you conduct the experiment over and over again, gather some statistics, find the landscape, or find the minimum in the landscape. And it's very much like these balls rolling down a hill. You start with an energy, you start with a set of initial conditions, the balls roll down a hill, and end up with some statistical probability in your local minimum. The hope is, in a quantum annealer, or an annealer that can exploit quantum uh, phenomena, you can use uh, the resources that are available to quantum systems that aren't available to classical systems, namely uh, tunneling and dissipation. So the hope is if you can start from fewer initial conditions, and because you can, rather than just having to go over these barriers to excite them thermally, or to just gather a lot of statistics by doing it over and over and over again, you can tunnel through. You can find that lower barrier, or that lower well more often. You can find it quicker. Uh, you can find it just more efficiently than you can in your, your best classical algorithms. And there's actually some experimental reason to believe that this happens. So Google, our close collaborators at Google at the Quantum AI Group, they have an office, at the office up in LA. They bought uh, this D-Wave computer, which is another flavor of this quantum annealer. So they built a series of, a set of coupled spins where you can program the 
years of neighbor interactions, you can carry out that calculation. And they embedded a whole bunch of different kinds of problems with it on it. And what they found is, in the exact sets of problems where you intuitively expect tunneling to help you, the D-Wave system outperforms the best classical algorithms for optimization. So there's, there's um, heuristic and reasons to believe this helps, but there's also experimental evidence that indicates that a quantum computer has resources available to it that classical computers don't. So the D-Wave computer and our hardware that we're building is too small to really rival the best uh, classical computers and data centers out there. So what we're doing is really trying to build hardware intricate enough and complicated enough so that we can do something genuinely useful compared to Google's massive data centers or even just like the Intel CPU on your laptop. So what we're doing here is, uh, what you see is again a, a, a zoomed in image of that chip I showed on the left hand side before. Um, and everything you see in dark here is aluminum. So we have a superconducting material. We take this, we put this on the bottom of the dilution refrigerator so we cool it down to 20 millikelvin, 15 millikelvin. What you see as these little squiggly lines are the actual qubits themselves. They're, uh, they're microwave resonators. So the, the frequency of those qubits is very much dictated by the length of those qubits. And they're also current carrying loose. So sort of schematically, what, what you're looking at right here is just a, a big what's called coplanar waveguide. So you have a trace of aluminum with a gap. in that lattice. 
But uh, the idea is that um, so that the, the the big picture idea here is that each one of these qubits, so each one of these dots is basically like one of those X's I showed. They have some kind of error rate. Every one time in a thousand or one time in a hundred, you tell it to do something, it does the wrong thing. And that's just not good for making your algorithm. What you can do is you can do some kind of, you can set them up in this specific structure and do a specific set of instructions with them constantly so that this tile of qubits, a tile of X's that I make, on the board, some sort of square array of these. It behaves like one qubit, but its error rate is drastically suppressed. So I'll skip ahead here. So you have this chart here where we have logical error rate, which is how often one of these x's will fail when I tell it to do something. And then you have each one of these different colored lines is a side of the lattice. So D equals three basically means, say, like a three by three square lattice in these things. Um, and, oh, sorry, sorry. What, sorry, physical error rate is the amount of time it fails whenever you do an operation on one of these x's. As, you, as your physical error rate goes down, the error rate of this composite guy, so this guy starts acting basically just like a super version of these guys, it'll start going down. So if you have a physical error rate of one in a thousand, the logical error rate will be basically one in a thousand, not getting any of that. But if I say make a D equals seven array, so I have a seven by seven array, my physical error rate of 10 to the minus three, I'll actually get two orders of magnitude. So this tile of seven by seven will have an error rate of one in 10 million, just because I've constructed them in the right way and I'm doing this judicious algorithm that I can do that. And the bigger and bigger we make the systems, and the less and less, the fewer and fewer errors we make, the steeper this curve gets. So we can make, say, relatively, we can actually kind of make this one in a, we can one in a hundred and one in a thousand in the lab. And if we make these lattices big enough, we can get way down into the floor here. So a conventional algorithm we want to do, let's say have 10 to the 8 or 10 to the 10 steps in it. So if we want to like factor a number or we want to do some sort of unstructured search, that would have a bunch of like 10,000 or 100,000 or a million steps in it. We don't want to have any errors in that step in that. So we want to have an error rate less than a million, or less than 10 million. We need to build a computer that has a big enough tile of qubits that's a sufficient physical error rate that we can actually get there. And this is an important concept because it means that it's not a matter of making more and more perfect qubits. It's a matter of getting to a, a level of um, fidelity, as we call it, so a, a level of perfection, and then just scaling up our architecture. So we can go and we can, we can envision making bigger systems with a couple hundred qubits that are a given error rate that we can achieve in a lab. And that's kind of an engineering target where we can say, we now have to make qubits with a one in a hundred, one in a thousand error rate. Uh, and we, but we don't want to make one with one in 10 to the minus 15, like that's just this astronomical number. But we can make a whole lot of them, and then we can use that to make this fully error-corrected digital quantum computer, which we can then hopefully give to some chemist or some other computer scientist that they can then put some high-value uh, uh, algorithm on. So what do we make of Google? So these are some very lofty ideas. What are we actually doing? So we make a little bit of everything. Uh, here's our stack up, basically. Like I just mentioned, our qubits, they operate at uh, 20 millikelvin, and we have to build those qubits themselves. So we have to build a whole bunch of really specific microwave wiring that's used to those harsh environments and the kind of signal to noise ratios that are going on. We have to build specific handmade, essentially, or hand designed control elements control hardware and electronics, which is kind of akin to a lot of the, the posters I see down here with like signal generation and arbitrary control. And we have to build a whole level of software on it. And then this is all kind of rolled up in the software. We're, we're kind of at the bottom of the stack. And I like to think about this as kind of the uh, building the assembly for like a, a CPU. We want to make it so that computer scientists and engineers can start running something on the stack without having to know anything about it. So we're building up this infrastructure so that we can then open it up to theorists, to computer scientists, and the people within Google to actually start using it. 
kind of stuff that you get is like the scratch resistant lens on a fancy watch. It's aluminum oxide, it's a really robust insulator, it's clear, it's nice, it makes for good photographs because you can shine backlight it and take pictures of the macro lens. We pattern, we put aluminum down over the whole thing and then we do some lithography. So we etch away these different patterns here in our, uh, in our metal to create uh, basically superconducting circuits. And then what we do is, so here's the, so here's kind of a more zoomed in thing. So schematically what we have here are our qubits. We have these things called readout resonators. These, these again are um, microwave resonators. So a given light corresponds to a given frequency. And then we have just a whole bunch of transmission lines and control lines. If you look at this in a micrograph, so the polarity is here kind of reversed. Everything you see dark is a cut in the aluminum. Everything makes it light in aluminum. So what we do is we have a bunch of aluminum wire and we cut this little X out. This little X is, our, is most of our qubit. It's actually basically just a capacitor. And then here in this little teeny tiny window, we have what's called the Josephson junction. And that's basically an inductor. So we have an LC circuit, and any electrical engineers or uh, people's knowledge of circuits knows this as a resonator circuit, basically. So you have some kind of resonator. The frequency of that resonator, uh, if it was a totally linear circuit, would be square root LC. What we do is we replace this resonator with a, it's called a Josephson junction, and that gives a, a, a tunable inductor. So the inductor here um, isn't just has an inductance, it has an inductance that is dependent on how much current you're running through it, or how much power you're applying. So that makes, does, this takes this normal parabolic potential, so this resonator with a given frequency, and gives you a whole bunch of <coughs> unevenly spaced levels. So you have a bunch of different frequencies. So you're basically making an artificial hat. So we have this potential with a bunch of levels. So we have our zero level, our first level, our second level, all the way up. This transition frequency is different than this transition frequency. So if we apply a microwave tone at this frequency, we take our qubit from our zero state to our one state. So we get we can basically switch our transistor, for example, from the zero to one. And what's important about that is that we don't go up to the two. So we can always stay within these, this subspace of these, these two levels. And that allows us to do some sort of logical gains. So this is kind of our, our transistor for, for quantum computing. So we have essentially our LC oscillator that's slightly nonlinear. We have this control line for basically applying these pulses they go from zero to one. And we have this other control line here, which I'm gonna get to on the next slide. Uh, yeah, which allows us to change the spacing of this frequency. So we can tune our qubits and we can address them individually. Uh, so this is what's called a squid. What this, what's in here is uh, we have a loop of aluminum and it's too small to see in here. But where these two little blue pads meet, you have a little bit of aluminum oxide, so a little trap capacitor, a little tunnel junction in there. And there, that's the kind of magic that makes this work. The amount of flux that we put in this loop dictates this frequency, so we can basically achieve uh, complete control of our qubits. And more of a technical detail, but this way we get Z control of our qubits, and, it, and by applying the microwave lines, we get X, Y control. So that's kind of like a technical Basically, we can do whatever we want to these qubits. We can make whatever quantum state we can want with the qubits. So, um, yeah, we can create an arbitrary quantum state. So we apply XY rotations. It's a bit of a jargon, but we can we can basically go between zero and one by applying microwaves, and we can tune these frequencies by uh, applying a, a flux to them. Uh, and it turns out that because of the way that the system is kind of globally architected, we get a very fast gain, which is really important because the quantum state is kind of delicate, and it only lasts uh, 20 microseconds as long as, which doesn't seem like a long time, but we can do an operation on it in say 12 nanoseconds, which is that, that figure of merit of the ratio of your time for your gate and the overall time of the, the, the time of the quantum system is really important. So you have kind of a, a, a building block for these digital quantum systems. 
I get entangled state. And that entangled state is important because that's the thing that starts to be really hard to simulate on dimensional hardware. So if you get a, enough of these entangled qubits around, the, uh, the number of possible states that can occupy is 2 d n. And the, it gets harder, exponentially harder and harder to describe that with a classical computer. And I'll get to that idea in a, a little bit later. But basically, we have this fundamental set of control. Uh, we can ascertain the state of our qubit um, using what's called resonator readout. So that little squiggly line you saw above our x, we have our x here, and we have that squiggly line above it. That's just uh, lambda over 4 resonator. So it's like an organ pipe, basically. That organ pipe or guitar string or whatever, when you add energy to it, it vibrates at a given frequency. And we can read that frequency. But if we couple our qubit to it, just a little bit, we can tell by a shift in that frequency what state the qubit's in. It's in the zero state or the one state. This allows us to get information out of our quantum system, but without destroying it. So instead of probing our qubit directly, we're just listening at this organ pipe, basically. We're just kind of getting a little bit of information. But what's nice is that we can uh, engineer everything well enough that we can get good enough signal and noise in fast enough time to be able to do all the operations we want. So what you see here is an experiment here where we set our qubit intentionally in the, in the one state and the zero state, and we measure a whole bunch of times. So each dot is one experiment. And we see that we can tell by uh, these two clusters of points that are well separated, we can tell which state we're making our qubit. And this turns out to be really important down the line we're trying to do something like that surface code thing I was talking about. And the really kind of neat thing about this is kind of really fast moving target. We've had, since I started in the group in 2012, and I'm not saying I'm taking credit for it, but um, since I, just a coincidence, I came into the group in 2012, we were dealing with things where the figure of error is what we call T1, and that's how long that quantum system lives. So you set up a quantum system, you basically go from zero to one, that's gonna kind of like naturally decay, just because it's very fragile. But by engineering our circuits and doing a whole bunch of fundamental materials research, we've been able to basically double every couple of years. Where our best, this is an older slide, so that's at 57 microseconds. We're up around 60 or 80 right now, and we still have to go a little bit higher. Um, what we're also doing in parallel here is we're trying to increase the density of these qubits. So my everyday job is basically as a hardware engineer is to go through and figure out what materials, what circuits we can do to go from that linear chain I was showing earlier to like a very large scaled up tile, like a very large integrated circuit. Uh, and I can talk about that a little offline if you have any more questions about this. But I'm gonna move up to stack. So the next neat thing that we have is the control of our hardware. So when I was talking about all these different control pulses, it turns out that it's really important to have very good pulses to generate really good signals. And you can't just go online and buy some arbitrary waveform generator or what have you. Uh, that's flexible enough and low enough noise that we can actually uh, use that. What we can do is we can take off-the-shelf uh, FPGAs and, and digital analog converters. And um, the kind of secret that's really enabled this research is commercial cellular uh, uh, hardware. So because all of our qubits work in this kind of 4 to 8 gigahertz range, this is a band that basically all commercial cellular works. So as a result, there's a whole industry around serving components and hardware for that. And we can just kind of mooch off that. So we can buy things off the shelf that will work in the exact frequency range we want to control our qubits. We don't have to design everything ourselves. This is kind of what a little competitive advantage we have with different architectures for superconducting qubits. But we still have to make a lot of ourselves. So th this mixture of custom and commercial electronics is a, another kind of competitive advantage that we have at Google's work. And this is very much the, it's a very Google idea. So Googlers are really into this idea of Google. If you see the intern there, that's okay. Um, but the idea of just like kind of not accepting the stuff that you can buy off the shelf and then just inventing it. So our, the group isn't afraid to basically make new arbitrary waveform generators, whereas a lot of other groups will just kind of use what they have to get off the shelf. Uh, and a lot of this is freely available online. Like we 
open sourced a lot of this stuff so you can go to John Martinez's website, figure out what's actually going on in this arbitrary waveform generation stack. And you can order your own boards and go nuts if you want. Uh, and the state of the art, just because it's a really pretty picture, I like to show is this nine qubit device. And on this nine qubit device, nine qubits in a row, um, we've actually been able to demonstrate, uh, oh, so there's more pretty pictures. Uh, what does one of these deletion refrigerators look like? So they're basically set up like Russian balls. You have a bunch of different stages. The lowest stage being the coldest this is 20 millimeter stage. And this is a, a picture of what you're at the bottom. They're all gold plated, so radiation, infrared radiation from the higher levels is shielded from the base level. And then you put a whole bunch of cans around them, like Russian dolls, to seal the very base away from all the stray radiation from the higher temperatures. Then we, we make our, our chips, the chip I just showed you. We have a custom made circuit um, mount, which you can kind of see actually here. So this is basically everything you see in this picture we've made or had designed. We, we made the chip. We have an aluminum box that has a certain kind of spec for microwave crosstalk or microwave performance. We have these handmade, we're getting away from these, these little handmade copper traces that we kind of put in painstakingly when we by ourselves. And we make all these wire bonds. We take that thing and we put it in some magnetic shielding because magnetism is going to be out, the enemy of superconductivity. And then we install that with a whole bunch of other kind of custom and commercial microwave hardware at the bottom of this solution refrigerator. And we seal it in a can. So we don't want any strain for radiation coming from the top. We put it in this big copper can. We over engineered these things. So, if any of you are familiar with dilution refrigerators, your typical commercial experimental physics dilution refrigerator is about this wide. You can take great pain to like put everything in a really small enclosure and you know, pack it up. Ours are the size of like extra large pieces. So we basically can cram as many wires as we possibly can. So this whole stack is like that. And then we want to be able to run 1,300 lines, 1,300 microwave lines or something. Some astronomical number that we don't even know if we'll be able to get there, but we just want to be able to record it. Um, and we seal it up, and uh, then we, we're basically the only group doing things of the sophistication that we're talking about. So we have to write our own software to control our own hardware to be able to conduct these experiments in a way that's kind of sustainable. And, and Justin and I were talking about a lot of this at lunch, like how do you do science, but at, at this Google level? And what we've learned is to apply a lot of the software in here, the only way you can handle this kind of uh, complexity is to apply a lot of software engineering principles that you learn, say, from open source or from the way a, a com company works, um, but to use like, really strict version control principles. Um, we have a mixture of open source. You can go to this repo right now and check out and contribute or whatever, some open source stack of software that we use. And then we can build on that in a sustainable way so we're making, what John always likes to say, we can make last year's like nature paper next year's so much. So we can Instead of every grad student or every new employee coming up and just having to re-engineer everything for themselves, um, they can actually build on what's there. And that's been something that's like crucially important. So uh, I'll just skip over this. The last thing I want to talk about, and I don't know if I have enough time to get into the right detail of this, but the, the big um, drive in this right now is to do what we call our quantum versus classical supercomputer challenge. The idea here is we're going to take our dilution refrigerator here, which sits in our lab in Santa Barbara, and try to do something on that that we can't do on Google's largest data centers, or the biggest computers that they exist in the world. And this is going to get a little fizzy at quantum mechanics, but um, I'll try to keep everything in a, uh, a broad enough way that people can at least get the take on that. So the idea is that we want to, after a certain size, 42 to 50 qubits, can't possibly simulate on conventional hardware what a quantum system is going to do. And we have to take advantage of that to do something on our quantum hardware that is intractable on the classical hardware. But we also want to do it in a way that we're showing that we have quantum resources, that we're not just making a cooked up problem that's hard. Because you can conceive of all sorts of really cooked up problems that are hard, but a problem that is actually quantum, a problem that is actually general in some way. And the way to do that is our theory group came up with this uh, thing called random gates. Um, so I'll draw a picture because this, I'll step through it to try to explain
explain it a little better. But so you have a bunch of qubits. So let's just assume they're in a linear array for now. So we have a lot of them, right? And like I was talking about, we have a bunch of control lines, so we can take this qubit, so time is going in this direction. And we can take this guy and we can do some kind of quantum gate, pi over two. We, we have a, a set of gates, a set of operations, just think of these as logical operations. And we have some random number generator or whatever where we pick a random gate. So we say, we're gonna do x over two. And then this guy here, we're gonna also do, we're gonna do a, a hat, and so on and so forth. So we're just picking from a hat which random gate we're gonna do. We're gonna do some entangling gates so that these qubits are all gonna be in one big entangled state. And then at the very end, we're going to read out, we're going to do that measurement there, sorry. So we're just going to read out a history. So this qubit's in the one state, this qubit's in the zero state, this qubit's in the zero one state, this qubit's in the zero state, this qubit's in the zero state. And then we do this like a hundred thousand times, a million times. We can do this a lot of times with this experimental thing, say, uh, I don't know, the, the two microseconds or something like that. So we do this a hundred thousand times, and then what we do is we get we have a whole bunch of bit strings, and we can order those bit strings in order from all zeros to all ones. And we have a certain probability of getting those bit strings. So we got one, 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 and uh, say two times out of whatever number of times it is. We got half zeros and half ones, say this, this many times. And this is, uh, you can start to tell from this distribution whether you have a quantum system or a classical system. Your classical system will act, so the average probability averages to one, since it's just, you're basically pulling numbers from a hat, you're randomly equally likely to get anything, so the random thing could be one. But what happens in a quantum system is if you rank the most likely, so say this is the most likely outcome, the least likely, what you get is this, this exponential distribution. So this is a simulation, a full quantum simulation run on some, I don't know, 30 or 40 cube, 20 or, yeah, I think it's a 30, it's a pretty big simulation, a 30 qubit system, and you, you take all the outcomes and you put them on a curve, you get this, uh, this, this order exponential distribution. If you are doing this on a classical system, it's trivial to know if you have a whole bunch of things that are equally likely to happen, uh, they're uniformly distributed across the probability space, so you just get a flat line. We want to take this quantum fingerprint and we want to use this as our uh, test bed for what we call quantum supremacy. So the idea that we can do something on a quantum computer that we can't do on this data set. So the, we want to build, say, a 50 qubit quantum computer in the lab. We can say take 100,000 or a million measurements, 10 to the 5, 10 to the 6. But if we have our 50 qubits, that's 10 to the 15 states. So we can't ever actually run this measurement long enough in the lab that we'll ever get the same, we'll be anywhere likely to get the same answer twice. Um, so how do we test our quantum computer? So the idea is we take the biggest computer we can find, we put the largest quantum system, we program the largest quantum system we can think of on it, and we build up this table. So this table tells us that we have, for every bit stream that's a possible outcome on this computer, you get a certain probability associated with it. So this is, this is our simulation. We then run our qubit until our uh, hardware engineers get tired or our electricity bill gets too high or whatever. We get 100,000 statistics, and we do, for the number of statistics, we do a cross correlation between the two. And we can tell by the fingerprint, we're basically, we get that full distribution that has that kind of like exponential state. We get that from a, the quantum computer, or sorry, the classical computer. And then we basically have a bunch of points kind of around. And we know that we're more likely to get the likely points on the, from the classical simulation. And if those occur or more correlated, then we know we take this figure of merit, and if we get a certain number around 0.42, then we know we have a uh, quantum system. If that number is point minus 0.58, then we have a classical system. So we have like a litmus test where we have on whether a quantum computer or not. Let's talk 
And then what we do is say, gee, we, we tried really hard to find a big enough computer that we could put 42 qubits on. But we happen to have three more qubits that we just turned off in our thing. So we can actually simulate like, trivially a 45 qubit thing. And we come up with uh, some statistics that basically you can't verify on the largest hardware available in data. And the idea here is to motivate our research going forward that, hey, computer scientists, uh, engineers, what, what can you do on this system that you can't do on this? Because we've actually shown that this is actually better than this by this bigger there. We, we can actually do something different. That's pretty, uh, that's impossible. And this is kind of the single-minded focus of that, that one side of the country, where we want to go through and demonstrate this quantum supremacy to show that at Google we have the hardware to, sh to do something that nothing else in the world can do. And right now, this is random circuits, but who knows, given this tool set, what the computer scientists or the engineers of tomorrow will be able to figure out. Whether or not you can find a picture of your dog or whatever. Or your current students. Or your current students, yeah, exactly. Exactly, yeah. So the idea is that if you build it, they will come. It's kind of a philosophy you're taking here. Um, and it's a really fun hardware challenge to, to build this. Because you can get your fingers in a lot of different, from touching the metal, like the silicon, all the way, all the way up to the side. And, uh, but it's also a really excellent uh, test of our quantum system. Because, so what I kind of gloss over here, so this is a classical thing. But if you do your simulation, on an ideal quantum system in a computer, and you add one, one piece of error, one, one error, you get back to your classical case like almost right away. So we have to make sure our circuit's shallow enough that the charging basically is short enough that we're not getting any errors the amount of time we do the algorithm. And we have to make our qubits good enough so that we, they don't have any errors whenever we make one of these random circuits because we're just dead in the water now. They were really expensive. So yeah, a little bit about us. We're located up, so this is always embarrassing, it's a picture of me and my own talk, but it's the only picture we have of one bridge. Uh, we're located, it took me three hours to get here, but uh, up in Santa Barbara, we have our own office that we, office slash lab that we basically um, had a hand in like meeting with the architects and putting together what we like to call our like nascent quantum data center. The idea is that we want to take something like this and we want to have something installed in a big data center. We just want to forget about it, or have the, I mean, you just forget about it, and just be able to use it. And that's kind of our same line goal. So this is our group, John Martinez is a PI, and we've actually hired four more people since the slide, so I need a new slide. Uh, somebody has a dog. And um, some references, some, it's really worth checking out. I've been talking to Justin, he says his course is based partly on GitHub, and that's basically what we use every day. We have a source that we trade between the University of California, Santa Barbara, and our group back and forth because we have a lot of cross-pollination because our group leader is still a, a faculty there. So we host our code on GitHub, and we have nice repos that we use, nice software engineering uh, hygiene techniques to, to keep everything in order and down the line. So you can check that out, github.com slash Um I can maybe The paper I was talking about is up on the archive, so the more theory oriented among yourselves can stay away from just the hard hand way the explanation from the hardware. Uh, and there's some good pieces. So John's website, UCSB from Martinez Group, you just look up, it's pronounced Martinez, but you can just spell it Martini if you remember. If you just Google that in publications, you get all our, our uh, papers and you can find all the pieces published by our grad students. Supremacy thing, yes, we will be money. 
just uh, running some of the standard quantum computing algorithms, like factoring large integers, why, why isn't that being used as a test problem at this uh, stage? Is it too difficult to do compared to the random stuff? Yeah, because the number of qubits you need to do Shor's algorithm is really, uh, so not the number of qubits, the number of, the circuits are deep, so the number of operations. So there's factor uh, a number that is meaningful that you can't just do yeah. like with a third grader or whatever, um, <laughs> is, is like 10 to the 15. So that means you can't have an error in 10 to the 15 operations, which means your error rate has to be less than 10 to the minus 15, which is the impetus between that whole like service code, the error correction thing I'm sorry. So you make an error corrected circuit of 10 to the minus three error ones, you make a whole bunch of them, then you get down to 10 to the minus 15, then you can start doing that. But you can't have any hope of doing anything useful until you get to those, those fidelity points. Right. <coughs> uh, that's Yeah, so we're looking at, so there's good reason, there's been a lot of research in quantum chemistry where they've shown, I'm not sure if it's exponential, like super polynomial uh, scaling for quantum computers, error correction quantum computers over classical computers um, for those quantum chemistry things. Sure, they all are little silly or winner in there, but it's not really known if it's actually useful for an unstructured database search, especially Google or Google. People have done that calculation, and there's, there's still ways to for some problems that are going to be So, according to QBC, what was Joseph's introduction that QBC actually can handle any access to things? The largest system we've had nine so far. Nine. Yeah. Yeah. So, they basically, you know, what do you expect? Because it's still far from. I mean, we don't expect there to be like a, a ceiling on the number. Um, so the, so the, the, gate, uh, the gate sequence 
for entangling arbitrarily large numbers of nearest neighbor qubits is still only two circuits, two deep. And you just entangle neighbors on one side and entangle neighbors on the other side, and then you can entangle all of them. So we have the fidelity to expect that there's no reason that scaling number of qubits would make that any worse than having our limited size.
not rigorous, but it's kind of, it's, it's tangible. It's a lot of fun. Exciting time. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
showed on your slide, though, was Scala. Yes. So those, those aren't checked into <laughs> Google's central repository. Because we're a bit of an oddball still uh, in that we're, we're, we're with um, the university. We're partially open source. Uh, so we have an open source project called LabRed, which is our kind of like RBC framework for the technical, uh, for talking a whole bunch of different lab equipment. Um, it's written in Scala. We have a software engineer that really likes Scala. It still has a lot of uh, advantages, um, but I mean, Twitter is written in Scala. The point here is, and that you're pointing at, it's not necessarily you want to be, you're not marketable for language, you're more marketable for your skills. And if you can pick up Scala, that's better than saying you just have Scala. Python's great because it has almost every like programming abstraction you know, They're really great learning language, and excellent scripting language. It's great for uh, scientific calculation because sci-fi and math all they're all powerful packages. And that's stuff that gets used. <coughs> one last follow-up question. Sure. This chain of thought. Yeah. Which is, suppose someone wanted to work with Google, what would set them apart during their interview if they had a particular skill set that you wouldn't Ah, so, need? so, um, just being an excellent problem solver, basically. Google is, takes the mindset that engineers are uh, completely general. If you have smart engineers, and maybe this is a, a not correct, but for the most part, if you have an engineer working on photos today, you can change them to the quantum AI team tomorrow, and they'll be able to pick up quickly enough to, to go. So the, the Google interview, a lot about this online. It's just it's very problem based and not language specific at all, and not skill based for the most part at all. There are other parts like within Google where, say, if you're going to work in cloud and you're going to be in architecture or something, you need to know a lot of domain specific knowledge. But as a, a general engineer, hardware, software, like my interviews were all just like really hard questions um, <laughs> and being able to pick up your feet. You may not be wrong or just test your own.